Edwards creeds. He had all six of those records. I don't, the seventh one's not a real creeds record. But he had the, the six. And uh, yeah, so I had to learn every song. So he turned you on to Greenus? No. And yeah, uh, yeah, but it was on the radio, you're right. They yeah. made those six records between 68 and 70. In three years, they made six albums. Yeah. And what was in your record collection before you met Dee Boone? Yeah, yeah. What no. was in your record? Yeah. yeah. What yeah, was? Yeah, yeah. What? Yeah. what? Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. I mean, yes? <laughs> no, I had more than one rock and roll record. You, you have some records? I had other rock bands. He only knew one. Oh, His knew pop one. was way into Buck Owens and, you know. Yeah. Um, I had a uh, first record I bought, 45, was American Woman by, I guess, who, a Canadian mm. band. And then the, this thing came on was uh, eight tracks. Right. And then there was, if you send in a dime to the Columbia Club, yeah. right, they would send you 10 and then one a month. You'd have to send it back or pay for it. Yeah. So I had, uh, there was an anthology of Cream. And I would, was into uh, anthology of Who. They would put these things. Like best ofs. Yeah, yeah. right, right, right. Um, of course, there was Doors and there was Jimmy, and I was aware of a lot of stuff. Alice Cooper. Were you thinking you were going to be playing, listening to this stuff? Like, no, this no. is what I want to do? No, no. What happened was his mother uh, said we were going to be in a band. Mm -hmm. So we moved, because I had to move from the Navy House into a projects. My pop got to see she yeah, but John Fogarty now in that Alameda. She said, fuck this moving shit, we're staying in Pedro. So we moved to a project that was just built called Park Western Estates. And he had, was an older one called Park Western. And uh, there was, an, it was 1970, right? So there's not a lot of guns. There's fighting and stuff. So she wanted us in the house after school. And that was the idea of the band. She played guitar, so her son played guitar. And uh, she said, I've been had a bass. Now, I didn't know really what a bass was. In the pictures, it looked like a uh, guitar. But you just had four strings, so. Okay, and uh, problem was, was those Credence records. You couldn't really hear the bass. Though. That's right, and especially with like, you know, yeah. coated with grape juice, and he never, we used the, uh, it didn't use the record covers to protect the records, and this hardware, hardwood floor, and the record players, very Kano, you have to put like eight quarters to keep it from skip. So I couldn't hear, but the, on the cover, I noticed the singer's shirts. You see, you noticed what? The singer's shirts. Oh, the shirts. The shirt. Singer's shirt. Shirts. Yeah. Well, he had different one on different records, but they were all flannels. We're gonna talk fashion now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I got into him. I thought if I wore the singer's shirts, he would still like me, even though I couldn't figure out what the fuck was going on with oh. this. <laughs> I think a lot. I think a lot of musicians start that way. <laughs> well, Mark Bolin had the first gig we went to was T Rex, and he had a boa. Uh huh. So I thought that was his rock and roll shirt. Oh, I see. Yes. I didn't know lumberjacks and farmers. I it was maybe housing. So when did you see T Rex? It was the slider. The slider. Tour. When you all it's all orange. Yeah. But you must it's have Long been, Beach Auditorium. But you must have been like 16 years old or something. No, no, no. 16 was California Jam. You, 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 the California Jam. Six dollars. <laughs> the California Jam was a huge, uh, important festival uh, in the early 70s. I never went to another one after that. I played it with the Stooges. Yeah, this was at Long Beach Auditorium. It's torn down. In the back room, they used to do the film, the John uh, Don Kirshner Rock Concert. Yes. Yeah. Did they have that here? Uh, there's this thing called Don Kirshner's Rock Concert. He invented the monkeys. It was kind of like, um, I don't know what it was like. Well, it, it, kind of top of the pops, or kind of like a super, um, what's it called? Super? Super Sonic. Yeah, Super Sonic. <laughs> <laughs> I can't it's where we're playing in Paris next. Money. Oh, Sonny, I think. Well, you know, you're, you're kind of in the Mark Boland's uh, neighborhood. Yeah, you were telling me that's bitch. Well, the first time I came to England with a minute, minute black flag, it was February of 83, it's snowing and cold, but I found out where the tree was on mm. the south part of the river here. And uh, a bunch of stuff was tacked on it. Cool. So you didn't go to like Trafalgar Square, you went to the tree where Bowen went to the tree. <laughs> yeah, it was really important. And uh, in fact, in those days there was no merchandise at the gigs, but there'd be bootleg guys a couple of blocks away. And uh, they took, what, I think it's right a White Swan, and they cut Mickey Finn out. And it was just Martin, it was $2, and it's the first rock guy I had on the bulkhead in my, oh, uh, where I caught. 
So it's kind of my more than John Fogarty is a rock. Uh, yeah, yeah. What do you call it? Idol. Inspiration. Inspiration. So you're a huge T-Rex fan. Yeah. Yeah. Which which was trippy because he wasn't that big in the U.S. I, I didn't. Man, I, I can't imagine. Yeah, he wasn't. But I can't imagine, especially in San Pedro, which is a very working class, yeah. south of L.A. kind yeah. of harbor uh, harbor town. Biggest one now. That that T Rex was not uh, really, um, you know, uh, really taken to by most of the people your age. No, but girls, girls who like went to Hollywood, uh, uh, liked uh, Bowie and uh, Roxy and uh, Roxy, yeah. yeah. Did you see those guys? Uh, no, I didn't. Get to you see told them. me, uh, but what I think is fascinating is that when you were a teenager, you had access to to seeing so much of what was going on in the early 70s rock and roll world by having access to these television tapings yeah. that were going on uh, where there'd be like- I saw Mark Bowler on a star, it wouldn't come up. He was yeah, angry. he comes up on the star. Yeah, but it wouldn't come up. Guitar, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you saw that. You know they had guys with, si with, with signs that said applause and shit like this. Yeah, they yeah. take these things. Yeah. Kind of corny. No, it blows my mind because I we're the same age, but I remember yeah. living in like a rural small town in Connecticut and watching that on television and to think that you could actually be there. Which yeah, is well, they needed work. a pad to somebody in the audience. Right? Well, I know they needed somebody in the audience, but I didn't realize you were in the audience. And Strut Long Beach is with that. was it. And D Boone also used to go with you. Yeah, yeah, of course. Your parents used to take you and drop you off yeah, there. Yeah. Take you His up. pop. His pop sat with us at the gig. His pop is from Nebraska. And didn't know anything about it. And there was hard Krishnas uh, sitting in front of us with sparklers. <laughs> it was a trip. It was a trip. The thing we didn't have, didn't know until the movement was clubs. I had no idea about that. That there was bands that played in clubs. Yeah, the whole idea, that whole thing. Yeah. Where people could sit this close. And, yeah. Well, how'd you discover that? The movement. The what? There was, the movement. Yeah, there was. Um, I mean, D-Boom was jamming with a friend of ours named. Mark Wasser, mm -hmm. and like tie your mother down and dust in your wind, whatever, copying, because you copied songs off records. You know, the best guy in town was the guy who could play Black Dog the best. No one used music for expression. It was all about having the skills to play Black Dog. Keggers. There was no club, uh, you know, there was no local thing you could play. I found out from with 125 months with the Stooges that there was all kinds of this in the 60s. Yeah. But I'm 13 in 1970, and Rock, you know, it kind of takes over the Nuremberg Rally paradigm. You know? yeah. <laughs> and so we don't. So we're copying songs, and this drummer turns out to be uh, Jeff Avicevich, but he's he, you probably know him as Nicky Beat. He's the drummer yeah. of the Weirdos. He we come out for a breather for Sweaty, and uh, he's wearing a coat tex around his neck, and his hair is all out. And he says, "You know, there's a scene." up in Hollywood where people write their own songs. <laughs> so it, and we went up and saw the bags, that's how we... Oh, and Nicky B was a, he was a Sam Peter. Weirdo, yeah, he's actually... He's the only kid walking around with, with a Kotex wrapped around his neck. Yeah, he's probably visiting home, right? He's probably living up there at that time. Yeah. I, I never got to talk to him about this. He be, you know. He turned us on. And he, he's not alive anymore. No, he's alive. He's alive, sorry. He's still alive. Sorry. <laughs> this is not going to be on YouTube. <laughs> he's still around. And it, I mean, it was very uh, profound because it changes our whole, it's a sea change for me and D-Boot, big time. Mark went on to uh, a deal of cards in uh, Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Really nice guy, though. And, uh, Nicky B, was a, wasn't he in the cramps for a second? I think so. That's right. Um, Kay played with him in the Monsters, the band with uh, Stan Lee and Darby, a uh, little short-lived thing. So, you know, uh, to go back to something you were saying earlier about playing bass and not really realizing that it was any different than a guitar, but it was, and it, it yeah, kind of makes me different. think about like uh, in those in that time. Again, people our age in like you know late seventies, early eighties, like getting involved with playing in bands um, and choosing the bass and playing the bass from a point and that's like kind of ground zero. And you've kind of approached- I didn't choose it. Uh, well, you didn't choose it, yeah, it's, kind of, it's kind of in your, it's, <laughs> but it's, it's kind of in your hands. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah sir, the thing is- I'm, I'm, real, I'm very grateful to her. She passed away when we were 18. Yeah. And uh, she's a huge pillar in, 
it was it was a huge blow. First time I learned how to lo lose somebody it was very very difficult. But I'm very grateful for her putting on the bass. Yeah. Well, my my, uh, my point is that I, uh, it seems that a lot of bass players in that uh, situation play bass as if they're playing a guitar. Oh yeah. You know, so. Well, in those days, what I found, a lot of guys were guitar players, and that's how you could get a gig because no one wanted to rock the bass. Yeah, yeah. But subsequently, a lot of the recordings that you hear, the bass player is playing in a way that isn't really uh, is traditional to what a, a, a bass is say like a zeppelin bass or you know uh, whatever the, the big arena rock bands it's something else yeah well you see those pictures you know and you see all those amplifiers on stage yeah. that's because that's how they and these things are built for sports and stuff and you couldn't hear right. ooh, ooh, ooh. i have to say though <laughs> the england records yeah they weren't afraid to mix the bass loud with over on our side, R and B was like that, and, yeah. he, and then in fact the guitar made room for him, all mm -hmm. trebly and clipped. Mm -hmm. But over there, man, even the Kinks and Animals had loud bass, mm -hmm. Lone Cream and Who, mm -hmm. uh, Tony Visconti on that Bowie record. Mm -hmm. You know, that's uh, interesting. Yeah. With the what do you think that is? Man, I don't know, but it helped me a lot. Geezer Butler, because I could learn. I could learn from this. I couldn't. Now I can hear the Creedence slides. Stu Cook did pretty good. What about Gene Simmons? I learned a lot from him. <laughs> believe it or not, uh, he did. Didn't he do like a bass tutorial in, in Hollywood? No, I never went to those. But and I remember when we we only saw. Him. You told me about it once many many years ago. And you're like, what is that? What no, is that? Paul Stanley had a rhythm guitar clinic. Oh. <laughs> Rhythm guitar solo clinic. Yeah, like right? this little rhythm guitar solo. Yeah, yeah, that was a trip. Also, the time he played a solo gig in Bogart, there was a club in Long Beach. It was our closest, right? Because all the gigs are in Hollywood, and then we could play in Long Beach. It was like, yeah, with a little drive. And he had a solo gig there. And he ran from the limo all the way into the club, and he got on the stage, and his mouth was full of picks, and he spit them all over the audience. <laughs> <laughs> but we only saw them play once when they had an album. But we saw them, they opened up for anybody. Like James Gang or oh, Campbell. Kiss, kiss it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, really corny shit. W w Wishbone Ash, Savoy Brown, whatever. Nitty Gritty Dirt Man. And uh, kind of a simple music in a way. Uh, New York Dolls. But uh, I don't know. When the album came out, it was so slow mm. compared to those gigs. Yeah. But there was a station called KNEC that would broadcast gigs live. And yeah. I had cassettes and I could hear the bass. And maybe it was an English uh, influence. You know? Yeah. You listen to those records, how big the bass is on those things, man. And it, it, uh, it helped me a lot. Yeah. I didn't have to, yeah, just count on the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> There was some, I gotta say, Dennis Dunaway, who lives in Connecticut. Alice Cooper? Yeah, I could hear him, and a little bit of yeah, Joe yeah. Bouchard in the Blue Oyster Co. Yeah, yeah. Did you, uh, so when you go to these gigs, you and Dee Boone, and get kind of radicalized, do you sort of draw a line in the sand and get rid of all your grand funk records and just like. We didn't like them. But we, uh, some of, yeah, some things were. Because Mark Farner is a yeah. right wing. Uh, is he? Ding -dong these days. Okay. <laughs> He's probably not the only one. I saw. I remember seeing uh, Jay Giles' band blow them off, but they were huge. Everybody had that Red record. Yeah, the second um, one. Where they get rid of Railroad. Bloodshot. <laughs> I think it's just called Grand Funk. Oh get, no! Oh, the Red Grand Funk record. <laughs> yeah, but they put it out <laughs> in the living room. I got to tell you about Seventies Fear. Well, I don't know on, on your side of the land, but over we were very uh, narcissists. All about us. You wouldn't listen to anybody four or five years before. Mm. It was really uptight, uh, uh, self gauge uh, generation. What, you mean like real, like blatant localism? Like you would put this the same record as like uh, some kind of like validation, mm. you know, at the house. You would rob a mota on the grand, the red grand funk record. Oh, I see. Yeah. And that was like, but Pedro a little better. Pedro was very heavy with Jimmy, Jimmy Hendrix. Yeah, and uh, also, you know. Uh, a lot more mixed town, the Latin guys. It wasn't just, it was this trip. Jimmy was really heavy, uh, and, liked by, and so was Black Sabbath. Yeah. Those, well, yeah. those guys were, 
so it wasn't all that stuff, and they were big and stuff, but the, but Jimmy and, and Black Sabbath was really big. And then later on, uh, Carlos Santana and Jeff Beck. And uh, I know, by that time, we were got, caught up in the movement, right? This is 77. Yeah, was, that's what I'm asking. Did you throw away all your Jeff Beck yeah, records? The, and... Well, as far as those people up in Hollywood, the 200 <laughs> punk rockers, right? It was a very small scene. Yeah. We're a very balkanized Southern California, maybe 150 towns. Right. Doesn't look like it. it looks like one when you fly. Yeah. But we don't know the Val, uh, the West the Inland Empire. Us, they thought anything south of Melrose was the beach. Yeah. You know, it's, it's crazy. No sea. So, but so you you could have another life. Yeah. They they, they didn't know about. You've seen Sir Drone. Maybe puts it all out there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, you, you could reinvent a whole thing. They didn't right. have to know. Right when the, the, the guy's afraid to show his ID, right? Because he's got the picture. Yeah. His hair down here. Yeah. Yeah. So you didn't have to do that. You could you didn't have a new name and get these clothes from, yeah. and put them together from the thrift store and ride on them. But Richard Hell, right? Yeah. That's a big influence on us. Um, and then the records from over here that we never even saw the bands, but they were just sounds. So that's what split us from the old days. Yeah. So what we thought about this older music was more, this just was something that, uh, that we did for prac. And they got our, um, and in fact, we had to kind of unlearn it. That's where we felt uh, tainted. And why we love bands like the Urinals, where these guys just put together a band. Yeah, we couldn't believe that. Why weren't we thinking that back then? You know, why were we copying? What what uh what what uh, bands from uh, England were you into? Oh so, man, those uh, all that wild stuff. Um, Mark Bradley played some last night. Alternative uh, Television, uh, The Fall, pop group Wire. Uh, of course, the ones everybody knew, like Sex Pistols, and maybe the first couple Clash singles and first that jam album, something. But a lot of those bands turned into regular rock and roll. We'd already done that. We didn't want to go down that. Right. right, but the ones that stayed weird, like the that that, that alternative television guy and the lemon kittens, and you know, lemon they might be Russians. I mean, and bizarre <laughs> stuff, right? I mean, it was just let's put out a record. Yeah. And that whole culture was really punk was not a style of music. It was more about you like this. We thought the style should be le left up to the bands. And, uh, that's the, the weird thing about us because that scene we learned in Hollywood, which was like also screamers and nervous gender, and they all quit. And then the hardcore, the young people from uh, want to play guitar fast, which is, you know, was there from the Ramones. That kind of becomes the thing. And we lost uh, some of that uh, experiment. You know, you wrote Little Alliance. Records. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You wrote us back in those days. Well, uh, I sent a, um, a cassette or a, a, a copy of our Confusionist sex record yeah. to you. Or I sent it to New Alliance, New knowing Alliance that records. the Minutemen were, that was their label. That we were inspired by SST. Well, I thought, I thought SST was too big. Like, SST was like, I thought that was sort of like sending, a, sending it to Warner Brothers, but there was this other label. And I was more interested in your label anyway, because the, the records I heard coming off of New Alliance sound more uh, closer to what we were up to, whereas SST was was like, was more thuggish, I mean, it was big rock. But it was beat puppets and it was Yeah, yeah, I don't know, but I just seemed, it seemed like more advanced and I didn't feel like we were, we were um, I don't know, I just felt like maybe start with that. I think it was mighty, <laughs> to see what happened. It was but, mighty feeble, right? Yeah, well, I like those records that you guys did, those compilation records on New Alliance, because all the, it was like, it was improvised music, you know, it was just things that were way more, um, just curious. But there was always a part of that in the 70s. Smegma, the yeah, yeah. Society, Free Music Society, there was this thing. Yeah, I like that. And here, you talk to too. these dudes at the gig, they were deep into music. Yeah. You know? Raymond plays me John Coltrane, I thought he was a punker. I knew he was older. I didn't know he was dead. <laughs> uh, you know, you know he's what? I didn't know he's dead. Who? John Coltrane. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know about that stuff, just like I didn't know about farmers and lumberjacks, you know? <laughs> Narrow, a navy. Yeah. Safe as something of a sailor. So I'm, I'm, yeah, I was learning. I still am. 
still stupid. But uh, do, do you remember the first? I do miss the surprise, and I, and I guess you know, New Alliance Records was supposed to be kind of a, yeah, surprises. I mean, yeah, but well, yeah, inspired by this movement that actually we find out about from Raymond, you know, things like Dada, and, yeah, uh, and we find out about you know Walt Whitman and uh, Woody Guthrie, and it, it's actually was. Big length of chain. Well, things. the fact that people all of a sudden were making records like that because yeah, that wasn't yeah. really something that um, you, 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 you don't really saw like in, in the, the culture of records. You know, unless you were sort of older and like kind of you knew about weird stuff in the '60s that were, that were yeah. kind of obscure. But it wasn't well, really John cool. Bowles, Byron Cole, you talk these yeah, cats. Yeah, there knew. was very few people who were who were clued in to that as some kind of. Um, you know, some kind of aesthetic that ha was happening really underground or whatever. Definitely so, in Pedro. <laughs> but there was a listener-supported radio station yeah. still there called KPFK. And there was a show on Friday. It was named after John Cage piece. It was called Imaginary Landscape. And the uh, yeah. the DJ <laughs> was Carl Stone. Yeah. And he would play trippy shit. Right. I mean, like I some dude s squeaking on a balloon, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, these days it was when we ate L. You know, just, I didn't go anywhere, but I'd lay on the deck and just let this shit trip me up. You were for like, ten hours. Yeah. <laughs> this, this music was, I thought psychedelic music should be really psychedelic and you're going to you know, go balls out. So, in a way, that radio show was like, yeah. it was. Uh, I think he's in Tokyo now making wow. Carl Stone. Yeah. yeah. Do you, you, you probably know him. No, no. Okay. He's uh, okay. in the uh, spot, Martin Spot, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Carl Heinz, uh, Stock House. And, mm -hmm. So I heard some of this stuff, and it was just a trippy thing. And I thought it was residue of, of hippies. I didn't really know it was there was a, a thing before that, mm -hmm. like the concrete and all the you know, mm -hmm. things from the turn of the century. I thought it was remnants of a hippie. Because you could hear. You thought it was hippies. There was another, like, yeah. A sad ass Carl, Carl was uh, more like uh, talking about it like maybe Academic. Byron or, or Don Bowles. But then the show after Tesseract, they kind of played some like that. But you could hear the sunflower seeds hitting the floor and shit. <laughs> you know? and it was definitely hippie kind of thing. Yeah, that was, so that was Friday nights if I didn't have work. And, uh, the, the other thing we did, because we ate a lot of L, <laughs> and uh, you would buy these records. No one would write about this stuff. Cream even didn't. Yeah. So we would buy records at Zed in Long Beach, mm -hmm. Zed of London. This guy Mike and his mom ran this uh, record store, and we'd buy them by the name or how the record cover looked. But we yeah. wouldn't listen to them. <laughs> Until time to eat this shit. And you know, can you bet the first cabaret will tear out. <laughs> Whoa, or uh, the prayer on fire of birthday parties. <laughs> I mean, just blow our fucking mind now. We, we had no idea what was coming up. <laughs> of course, the second time you kind of knew. The first time, so last time I ate Al was. Einstein said it's a night mountain in the desert. <laughs> oh, you went to that game. Because you did the second one, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. We did the first one, they did the third one. Yeah. I think Stuart Sweezy now is putting this out yeah. called uh, Desolation Center. Yeah, the and I ain't there, and some motherfucker had a gun and was shooting in the crowd and said, no more L. <laughs> I don't know what it had, had to do with anything, but they just never, never ate it again. Do you remember the first time you, uh, you, you came to England? I seem to remember. Yeah, Black Flag. Oh, no, that was the first time you came. Yeah, man, man, Black Flag, 83, first, all three of us, me, Georgie, and D. Boone, had been overseas. Where, uh, where'd you play in London? Do you remember? Two gigs. One was called 100 Club, yep. and one was called Brixton Ace. Yeah. And I think it was on the south, uh, south of the river. Uh, and the other the, one. Uh, well, no. Well, the Brixton Ace is, was where? Is where? What? <laughs> Probably in Brixton. Brixton. <laughs> and they called it the hood. What, what tricked me out was they called it the hood. Also, brothers with accents. Was I've only lived here seven years. Okay. <laughs> I, uh... But that was our first time. It was, it was... You, uh, so was, was it just the, the package of you, Black Flag, and Minutemen, and was there... sometimes Bugger would play with Billy. Yeah, you get high school plays. But 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 uh, but um, what do you remember about the, the gigs here in, in, in London? The owner uh, was interesting. Uh, uh, he said all the uh, press was communist, and the 
uh, one of the bouncer guys uh, showed me a card that said uh, National Front, and if you lived where I lived, he'd have a gun and. Sometime. Where was this? At the Hundred Club? Yeah, yeah. It was not that much. My father's grandfather's a Klansman, you know, I'm not that impressed by shit. Like that. Really? I didn't pick it. <laughs> no, I'm saying, yeah. Fuck him. Yeah, yeah. I finally went to the town. I would always avoid the town. It's in Arkansas called Earl. Uh-huh. Uh, 25 miles west of Memphis. And that's where your family... No, his. My his father's family. father. My mother's people are from Italy. Middle. Where they invented fascism. <laughs> it's not where you're from, it's where you're at. <laughs> Very nice. Well, on that note, uh, I don't know how, I mean, we could talk forever. But as, <laughs> In Pedro, we call it windbagging. <laughs> if anybody has, has any questions, uh, otherwise, uh, Mike and I will just stand up and, and we're going to... We're gonna, uh, freely improvise. I gotta tell you, can I say one thing? Yeah, of course. Yes. I lose, I got the music because D. Boom Rack, yeah. and I lose him in a wreck. And I thought no one wanted to see me without, uh, play, do bass right, without him. And uh, I took Kay to, she had an internship after Kira. graduating, yeah, yeah, UCLA, in New Haven. <clears throat> and on the way back, I stopped, and you're in Martin B.C.'s. Oh yeah, we were recording uh, Bad Moon Rising. At no, Martin. Evil. Oh, Evil, yeah. And you gave me the bass, and Lee wrote, actually only Steve played with me. Yeah. But you said, you're gonna play. Yeah. And that's the first time I played bass after he was killed. That was very important. And then you had me play to the Kim Fallick record. Yeah, the bubblegum, and then we decided to do the, the Chaconi. You, you know, you did. You know, I said, yeah, yeah. okay, I'll get back into music, and, and that that really helped me. Well, good. I'm glad. That was the second win. That I, I'm forever in your debt. I'm, I'm pretty sure you would have uh, you would have gotten back in there. Okay. But the reality own, was, but, uh, I'm, I'm glad forced the issue. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, yeah. thank you, folks.